Hello friends, welcome to yet another session of Oral Medicine and Radiology series. Today we will be dealing with aphthous ulcers. Before we go to an aphthous ulcer, let's see what's an ulcer. By definition, an ulcer is a breach in the continuity of the epithelium of the skin or the mucous membrane to involve the underlying connective tissue as a result of micromolecular cell death of the surface epithelium or its traumatic removal. These are the various parts of an ulcer. This is the margin or the junction between the surface and the ulcer proper. This part is called as the edge and this is the floor which is visible and this is the non-visible part and it's called as the base. The ulcer actually rests on the base. This is what you see here is the epithelium and this part is the connective tissue. So you can see that the connective tissue is involved here. So if uh, the connective tissue was not involved, if it was just a superficial area, this could have been called as an erosion. So only since this connective tissue is also involved, it is called as an ulcer. So let's go to the classification of ulcers. So according to the 11th edition of Burkitt's, we can classify ulcers into four. The patient with acute multiple lesions, the patient with recurring oral ulcers, the patient with chronic multiple lesions and the patient with single ulcers. Under patient with acute multiple lesions, we have herpes simplex virus infections, varicella zoster infections, cytomegalo infections, Coxsackie virus infections, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis and periodontitis, erythema multiforme and severe forms of that that is Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, oral hypersensitivity reactions. All these come under patient with acute multiple lesions. And under patient with recurring oral ulcers, you have recurrent aphthous stomatitis and Bechet syndrome. Okay, so this is what we will be dealing with today. And under patient with chronic multiple lesions, we have a list of vesicular bullous lesions actually. That is pemphigus vulgaris. Paraneoplastic pemphigus, pemphigus vegetans, subepithelial bullous dermatosis, bullous pemphigoid, mucous membrane pemphigoid, linear IG disease, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, chronic bullous disease of the childhood. And under patient with single ulcers, you have traumatic injuries causing solitary ulcerations, that is your traumatic ulcers, and traumatic ulcerative granuloma, that is your eosinophilic granuloma of the tongue. And then you have three other deep fungal infection that is histoplasmosis, blastomycosis and phycomycosis which is also called as mucormycosis. And this is another classification just added to uh, make it a little bit uh, simple to understand. This is based on etiology, you can actually uh, divide ulcers or group ulcers based on the etiology part that is traumatic, infectious, drug induced, ulcers associated with blood dyscrasias immune mediated, oral ulcers associated with dermatological disorders, oral ulcers associated with GI disorders that is gastrointestinal disorders, neoplastic oral ulcers and ulcers of uncertain etiology. So the aphthous ulcers come under ulcers of uncertain etiology. Coming to recurrent aphthous stomatitis or recurrent aphthous ulcer. Okay. So, uh, in short, you can call it as RAS, short for recurrent aphthous stomatitis. So, recurrent aphthous stomatitis is the most common oral mucosal disease and is found in men and women of all ages, races, and geographic regions. So, it doesn't actually have a particular gender predilection, it's because uh, it, it can be equally seen in men as well as women. It's a disorder characterized by recurring ulcers confined to the oral mucosa in patients with no other signs of disease. So, this is why it's called as a recurrent aphthous ulcer. The exact etiology is still unknown. Suggested causes of recurrent aphthous stomatitis are local factors which include trauma, smoking, salivary gland dysfunction, microbial factors like bacterial and virus diseases, exposure to certain drugs like say NSIDs, 
systemic factors like allergic reactions such as HIV, Bechet's disease, also known, uh, hormonal influences, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, neutropenic ulcers, PFAPA syndrome, magic syndrome, sweet syndrome. Uh, these are actually uh, syndromes associated with uh, oral ulcer formation, after ulcer formation. Uh, Bechet's disease. Uh, here you have uh, oral abscess ulcer formation along with you know, ulcers in your eyes, conjunctiva region especially. You can have also um, genital ulcers. Okay, that's vicious disease. It's uh, immune mediated disease. Okay. And then you have uh, PFAPA syndrome, which is uh, periodic fever, abscess stomatitis, uh, parotitis. Sorry. Uh, Pharyngitis and adenitis. Okay, you can have abscess ulcers along with all these other disease or conditions. In magic syndrome, uh, you have oral ulcers, genital ulcers, as well as uh, inflammation of cartilage. In sweet syndrome, you have uh, abscess ulcers or oral ulcerations along with. Uh, rashes in various parts of the body like your trunk or arms etc okay then coming to uh, nutritional and uh, hematological deficiencies this will also be considered the beginning of the course okay. uh, the depletion of iron zinc folic acid vitamin b1 b2 b6 and b12 okay then there are uh, genetic factors and immunological factors also actually. Coming to the various clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis, recurrent abscess stomatitis, mostly it is seen in the second decade of life, that is around the 10 to 20 years. The problem of localized burning or sting or pain can be felt 24 to 48 hours before proper ulcer formation. A localized area of erythema first develops, and within hours, a small white papule forms. It ulcerates and gradually enlarges over the next 48 to 72 hours. The individual lesions are round, symmetric, shallow, but no tissue tags are present. Multiple lesions are seen, but the number, size, and frequency of these vary. So, according to these, uh, actually, you can subdivide abscess ulcers into three that is, minor, major, and property form ulcers. It's usually uh, seen in the freely movable oral mucosa, that is your uh, non keratinized mucosa. Okay, uh, ulcers are mostly seen uh, involving the labial and the buccal mucosa, but also occur on the tongue, the mucobuccal fold, floor of the mouth, and the soft palate. The keratinized uh, part of the lip mucosa, the hard palate, and the gingiva are rarely involved. Uh, so, as I told you, uh, these are the various pictures of abscess ulcers. This here, uh, can be considered to be a minor abscess ulcer owing to its uh, size, which seems to be less than one centimeter. Okay, and this uh, could be considered as a major abscess ulcer because uh, it looks like uh, it's more than one centimeter or almost one centimeter in size. So this can be considered to be a major abscess ulcer. <coughs> this, these here. Uh, looks like uh, herpetiform ulcers. So here you can see small ulcers, but a lot of ulcers. So these can range from around uh, 50 to 100 ulcers. Okay. So such a presentation of uh, abscess ulcer is called as a herpetiform ulcer. Okay. As time proce uh, proceeds, you can actually see that these minor ulcers are maybe small small ulcers they can coalesce to form larger ulcers okay. coming to uh, the three subtypes of abscess ulcers in detail so when you check for the numbers you can see that minor abscess ulcer can range from 1 to 10 so it's usually multiple okay major it's usually one or two you can go up to five and then herpetiform you always have a huge range that is from 5 to 100. You can have almost 50 or 100 
variations in one particular area. You can have colonies or crops of oysters. Okay, and coming to the size, you can see that uh, it's around five to ten millimeter. That's less than one centimeter. Major is always more than one centimeter, or from one centimeter. Or it can be one centimeter. And herpetiform oysters is always less than 0.5 centimeters. And coming to uh, the pain sensation, the major apis ulcer, since it occupies a large area, and therefore a lot of nerve endings are involved, and the pain attributed can be severe. Whereas in your minor and in your herpetiform ulcers, it can range from mild to moderate. Coming to the duration, you can see that the major apis ulcer it takes a little bit more to heal. It takes more than two weeks to heal. Whereas your minor and herpetiform ulcers, they heal within two weeks. Regarding scarring, again, major apis ulcer heals with scarring, whereas the other two variants don't form scars. The location is almost uh, similar. Uh, it's usually the um, labial or the soft palate region or the non cavernous mucosa which is involved. Coming to the incidence, you can see that uh, the minor apis ulcer forms the major share or it's uh, the minor apis ulcer that is always usually seen when compared to the major or the herpetiform variants. The diagnosis, it doesn't actually uh, require a particular lab procedure to form a definitive diagnosis. Uh, it is kind of uh, diagnosis of exclusion that is you rule out all the, other, all the other conditions and then you zero in on apis ulcers. Okay. You can also always see the clinical presentation and a bit of history and then you can go for this particular diagnosis. <coughs> there is no particular requirement for biopsy to provide a definitive diagnosis. You may rule out malabsorption and eliminate nutritional causes. That is, you know, anemia, secondary to depletion of iron or folate or vitamin B12 or ferritin stores. And again, you can go for virological investigations if you suspect herpetic form, sorry, herpetic involvement, herpes involvement. But again, these are not really required. If you can just go for the clinical presentation and exclude all the other conditions, just to exclude. Uh, nutritional states and the viral states or the viral diseases you can call. So this is not a definitive diagnosis but a diagnosis of exclusion. Coming to uh, the various differential diagnosis, a proper detailed history and a proper examination are the requisites for uh, diagnosis of oral aptus ulcers. All these can be considered to be uh, differential diagnosis for apis ulcers, traumatic ulcers. So here you can find a trauma traumatic agent, maybe a sharp tooth, a jacked border of a denture, a broken piece of wood, something like that. So you always have a traumatic agent. And coming to oral herpes infection, you could have fever. Or the ulcer could be preceded by a small vasitis or a blister. Okay. So that's how we can roll out herpes infection. In cyclic neutropenia, you have uh, ulcers forming every 21 days. So if you uh, go for a little bit of history, you can find out this. And then we can go in for certain lab procedures where we can check the neutrophil count during this particular day as well as the other days. So you can compare both those states and then zero in on cyclic neutrophilia. In Erthema multiforme, as the name suggests, multiforme, we have various types of lesions here. An ulcer is also one of the forms where uh, we could find uh, erythema multiforme present in the oral cavity. Okay, so you could have blisters, sorry, you could have ulcers, you could have vesicles, bullae, 
happy words uh, erosion all the forms can be seen okay. but in erythematic forming you could also have skin lesions you could see target lesions or bullseye lesions okay so that could easily help you to roll out the sperm abscess ulcers coming to uh, tuberculous ulcers usually it's seen as solitary ulcer it's painless it's seen in the tongue or the heart palate and you will have history of a cough or something which actually brought in the infection from the lungs to the oral cavity okay then again you can go for your lymph nodes and check and then coming to syphilitic ulcer the uh, the secondary stage that is not the shanger or the gamma but the mucocutaneous lesions they kind of uh, resemble that to salsa but again you can rule out with proper history coming to the treatment aspect so uh, as we discussed the probable causes or the etiology for the abscess ulcers this is not a very specific uh, treatment regimen you can see that uh, it's a more generalized kind of a treatment we offer for uh, abscess ulcer okay first of all you try to eliminate all the local factors try to reduce the stress avoid acidic or salty or spicy food abstain from alcohol or carbonated beverages or any other possible causes which can cause abscess ulcer lesions okay and then the next step is topical therapy so you can go for analgesics or anti inflammatory drugs antimicrobials or corticosteroids under analgesics and anti inflammatory drugs we have lidocaine or lignocaine diphenhedramin benzodiazepine hydrochloride milk of magnesia etc so uh, usually uh, a lignocaine or a lidocaine gel or ointment is given it's applied topically you can also uh, use uh, benzodiazepine mouthwash this is a particular drug which is best given as a mouthwash so in areas where you cannot place your finger or uh, you know the applicator that is maybe you know extreme parts like you know the oral cavities um, oropharyngeal part or areas where your finger cannot reach or penetrate or can cause nausea you can use this particular formulation uh, gargle form or the mouthwash form where you can actually gargle and you know apply the uh, medicament to a particular area okay then you have antimicrobials like uh, chlorhexidine gluconate which is available as a commercial name under the commercial name listerine or uh, tetracycline mouthwash all these can be used this again can prevent secondary infection again you can see that uh, it is not a specific treatment it just prevents secondary infection thereby reducing the healing time of the particular ulcer and then when you have uh, severe um, lesions which doesn't actually heal very fast you can go for corticosteroid topical corticosteroids usually tramsinolone or pitamethasone clobetasol propionate are usually given uh, the most commonly used uh, corticosteroid in the topical form is tramsinolone acetaminophen which is available by the name kenacort or tess okay 0.1 percent is usually given clobetasol propionate can also be given which is actually uh, more long standing but usually it is given in the dermatological lesions rather than oral lesions but along with the noro base it can be used for oral lesions also then uh, long acting drugs or sorry long acting uh, steroids like dexamethasone can also be given uh, in the form of elixirs okay and then in case where uh, these ulcers do not respond to normal topical application you can go for intralesional injections okay this is most uh, mostly given for recalcitrant cases which doesn't respond to normal cases normal medication uh, these again are uh, 
corticosteroids given in injection form. Then there are others like amylexinox, acanthropin, cyclosporin, which are uh, immunomodulators or drugs uh, which are used for cancer therapy. Cyclosporin, acanthropin, etc. Um, amylexinox uh, is another drug which is a recent drug, not very recent but considerably recent and it has given very promising results when used as a 5% uh, paste or ointment uh, gives very promising results in the oral cavity it has been earlierly earlier sorry it has been earlier used as a dermatological uh, medication but now uh, along with oral base it has been uh, very successful in treating oral ulcers especially it helps in reducing the pain uh, means increasing the time when the next ulcer appears and uh, you know, it, uh, the frequency is also reduced okay. then you have uh, ulcer protectants like sucralcate which actually coats the ulcer so it can also be used and then you have uh, other natural products like aloe vera which helps in soothing or uh, giving a soothing sensation this can also be uh, used on top of ulcers as topical therapy then where uh, topical therapy doesn't really work very well we go in for systemic therapy you see that uh, immunomodulators are given mm. they include levomazole, thaliomide, colchicine, petoxifilin, capsone, xanthorpin etc you also have antioxidants, vitamin B12, folic acid. So here uh, it's actually a mixed bunch. It's not actually a proper immunomodulator. The levomazole is not uh, a, a proper, um, uh, not a proper drug which can be included in an immunomodulator. It is actually an anti-helminth, but when used in a particular formulation and a particular dosage, okay, it can act as an immunomodulator. Again, here pentoxifilin. It it is a uh, vasodilator, colgesin, again used for treatment of gout, but when used in a particular dosage, it can act as an immunomodulator and reduce the formation of abscess ulcer. ulcers. Okay. Then again, uh, here uh, antioxidants can be given to reduce oxidative stress, scavenge on free radicals, and then detoxify, prevent ulcer formation. Okay. Vitamin B12 and folic acid again, a nutrient supply helps in faster uh, healing okay, then again uh, others like uh, prednisolone, triamcinolone, dexamethasone, dexamethasone can be given as uh, systemic drugs where it doesn't actually respond to topical therapy okay and then you have uh, rebamapide um, which is recently been successfully used uh, for treating both gastric as well as oral ulcers okay so this has been increasingly used nowadays in clinics uh, where you have gastrointestinal as well as oral ulceration together okay uh, you have also other uh, therapies like ultrasounds and lasers of tissue lasers where uh, these have been proven to reduce the healing time so the healing time is very fast and again uh, the pain has also been reduced so all these modalities have been tried to treat abscess ulcers in increasing success rate so there is no exact uh, you know magic wand or a, a proper treatment we, we actually have to tailor make each uh, you know, treatment for a particular patient depending on uh, how he presents and how the frequency uh, of each ulcer or each uh, recurrence of it. Okay, so that is how you treat abscess. So with that, we'll end this session today. 
Thank you. Stay safe and stay enlightened.